gonna do that one more time. Come on, we're gonna just do that one more time for y'all singing. All right, now. Oh my gosh.
They're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that they'd be asking you, Lord, what's the next step? God, where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do? God, what needs to happen in their life? God, to finish the course. But God, at the same time, I pray for individuals who are struggling, who are walking, God, in those areas where they're wondering. They're, they don't have the assurance of their salvation. God, maybe they've never proclaimed Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. They don't know about the blood. They don't know about the cleansing blood, the redemption, the freedom that comes from that. God, I pray this morning that there would be a drawing of God like never before. There would be a response of individuals. God, as they let you have control of their life. God, I ask you this morning and just say you're welcome to this place, Holy Spirit, that you have total freedom in this building this morning to deal with lives, to deal with us to the deepest, darkest moments of our life, God. I pray that we'd be free in Jesus because we ask for forgiveness. Lord, we proclaim it this morning. We know that we have an appointment with God, and Lord, we need to be ready, that we need to be open to the opportunities that present themselves this morning. So God, this morning, that you would have this time that is totally dedicated to you, that everything that we do, everything that we say, God, it's all about you this morning. Father, I ask you, Father, to intervene in lives and touch this morning like we've never seen before. God, I pray. Also this morning for uh, Ms. James McGee this morning. God, I, I lift her to you in a very special way today. God, her and Dr. for one of ours, and, and we pray for them, God, and so many of other seniors, uh, Ms. Pryor and Sinez, and so many more that Brother Coy and others that are not able to be with us on a regular basis. God, I pray, God, just for intervention in their lives, for their touch, for wisdom. God, I, I pray this morning for people that, God, we would open our lives unto a holy and mighty God, to the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and allow you to minister, God, at our points of greatest need. God, I want you to get the victory in this building this morning. God, it's this time, this worship, it's a, it's a time that's set apart for us to come together for the purpose of worship. So, Lord, you get the glory. God, let it be known right now. Let it be, even begin right now, God, the love of Jesus as we share one to another, God. We commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Turn and greet your neighbors this morning.
Major part, five bucks of the church, fellowship, and just enjoying one another. And, uh, somebody needs those touches. Somebody needs those kind of work. You're in Bible studies. Uh, hopefully we learned a lesson about our mouth and how we speak this morning. If you weren't there, you ought to have been there, but get it and look, take a look at it because it's uplifting and uh, what an encouraging time. Good to see you. Welcome to you. Thank you, guests, for being here. We're honored that you've come to worship with us, and we want you to just uh, enjoy the fellowship and grow the love of God. I just, my prayer is to have an encounter with God like you've never had before. Same thing, church family, uh, that we're open to that. And uh, thank you for being faithful and uh, reach out and touch one another. If you don't have a worship guide this morning, if you would kindly raise your hand. We want to give you one, Brother Paul and uh, Brother Tim. You guys will help us with that. And uh, all the way from the back to the front. As you receive your worship guide this morning to uh, church family, let me just take it in a different order. Church family, if you will take your Get Connected card this morning, first of all, update your information to us. If you have emails or different cell phones or text or whatever, address change, we need that. Also, we'd like to know about your touch. How did you touch the kingdom of God this week? What happened in your life? If you have breakfast with a group of men, what happened in that? How did you speak Jesus into that meeting? If you have lunch with a group of ladies, how did you speak Christ into that meeting? If you're at work, what happened with that? If you're at Walmart, was there a checker or somebody there, one of the ladies or one of the men, if you were able to speak Christ into that, maybe he's at a restaurant, maybe able to speak Christ into that. I don't know. Write that on there. We want to know about that. We want to know about your touch and uh, maybe... Uh, just uh, what God's doing in your life. Got a note there. You may say, well, I'm on up in years, and uh, here's what God's doing in my life. I want to finish well, and uh, don't have many years left, probably, but I want to do what God's called me to do and speak into that. And then for our guests, we want you to fill it out and just share your information with us. And uh, you place it in the offer plate, or you can leave it on a few. You may have questions. You may have comments about the worship service. We'll be able to uh, take a look at those. But we want to pray with you in regards to all of that. Uh, this week, and as you have opportunity, or we have opportunity to pray with you. I mentioned Miss James a moment ago, and let me just say to you, she's in room 2009, and I know she needs some uh, some folks just to come by and encourage her. If you do go there, uh, just uh, don't stay a long time. Just visit, say hi. We're taught that from the ministry and ministerial standpoint, and I, I you know, it's very seldom do we even pull up chairs. We'll stand and talk, and, and we'll make our way. So I want to just encourage you to go by there this afternoon just be kind and uh, they need the uplifted plus there'll be other people coming by so just be mindful of that and be praying. Uh, they're kind of in a dilemma uh, with her arm being broken and what's going to happen with that and her shoulder's frozen and uh, it's just some, some big decisions that have to be made. So uh, just be, I talked with Doc a long time this morning and uh, they need some wisdom. And uh, so I'm just, I, I told him I'd share that with you. I'd share with you about going by. Uh, he and I had a talk about that this morning. And uh, just encourage, be uplifted when you go by there. You don't even talk about the arms, final thing. Just be, up, be encouraging, uplift them, uh, those kinds of things. And pray with them and, uh, and be on your merry way. And uh, just be able to do that. Just uh, lift folks to the Lord, okay? And hey, be mindful that you have an opportunity to touch somebody. Uh, Wherever you go, whatever you do, and uh, speak Christ with the Lord. Okay? All right. Guys, come forward. Let's work together this morning through our giving aspect. And uh, next Sunday, we'll receive our offering for Margaret Lackey, uh, our state missions offering. And just remember that. We've asked you to pray a lot of you have already given, which is fine. And uh, we'll culminate that last next Sunday. And for those of you that may not know what Margaret Lackey is, it's our state missions offering. Uh, and it goes to, to fund so many different things as far as helping on mission trips. We'll have a fall festival coming up in a few weeks. It helps with that at the Seaman Center, uh, Camp Garraway, Central Hills. Uh, I mean, so much there. Hispanic ministry, church plants. Uh, it's just so much that we don't even realize what Margaret Lackey often does in the state of Mississippi. So uh, the $2 million go, and we want to do our part. Many of you already have, and maybe you've given. I'm going to challenge you to give more, and uh, let's see what God will do through that next week, all right? Uh, also, you'll have opportunity to give through the op Operation Christmas Child. I'll say more about that a little bit. Uh, some of you asked questions about shoeboxes. I'll say more about that in the closing service. Let's go to the Lord and just enjoy this time of worship. Could you do that with us? 
God, this morning you've, uh, you've given us opportunity to give. God, you've changed our lives. God, you've put us on the path to serving you. And God, we can't do it any better than when we're serving through giving of our time and our monies. God, our talents. We all have something that we ought to be doing in the kingdom of God. But yet all of us ought to be giving. God, that's a command, a direct command from you. That we ought to be giving to the work of the local church. And then extending that out literally around the world. And God, you've given us great vehicles like the Cooperative Program, like Bloodywood Christmas Offering, and Andy Armstrong Easter Offering, and Margaret Lackey State Mission. God, you put other venues in our place to be able to uh, to be able to give and to worship through it. So God, help us this morning. Lord, let us give. Let us learn to give sacrificially whenever the opportunity arises. And Lord, this morning we had that opportunity to give to the local church and yet far and near. So help us this morning to start, to begin, or to continue, Lord, to be faithful in all that we do, God, for your glory and your honor. In Christ's name, amen.
Psalm 127 this morning. While you're there, uh, kindergartners to fifth graders, if you'll come on down and meet uh, Miss Abby and Miss Gordon. Yes, if you have a kindergarten through fifth grade and you want them to go to kids' worship, if you'll allow them to go to the back, they'll be in the back building. All of you need to go back and retreat them back in the back building. You'll go through and uh, turn right and you'll see them there. You'll find them at the close of the service. They've been having a great time back there. And uh, Annie and Jordan doing an awesome job. Praise God for that. A home where God dwells. A home where God dwells. God's been dealing with me over this message for several months. Uh, kind of as the message we did uh, that he led me to a few weeks ago with Water Basin and uh, just some things that there's no secret in our society today that the fault, the, the home, the family, uh, the biblical model of the family is under great attack. I was listening to the Today Show recently and there was a marriage guru, a relationship guru on there and they asked him a question. They said, uh, how do you feel about people living together? And here's how he answered it. He said, I don't think anybody ought to get married unless they live together first. He said, how can you plan to live a life with somebody when you can't live together with them one day, one week, one month, much less six months. And he took his analogy and he based it on that. And You know, I, 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 looking back in the 60s, in the 1960s, and prior to that, checking up, living together or whatever was totally socially unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. And now today, we have some 50-year-olds and above over almost 3 million that are living together, not married, 50 and above. Uh, we have a uh, large percentage, over 50%, somewhere in the neighborhood of more closer probably to 60% of other ages, 18 to 39, 40 in that age range that are living, especially females that choose to live together before they're married. And, and so we see the breakdown of the family as you and I know it. And, and, we, and you begin to dig and look, you see some things going on there where Satan literally just kind of laughs and mocks is what goes on with families today. He sits back and he, and he has a heyday with that and, uh, and he really laughs at those who are really trying to live the Christian life when things are not right at home or in their life. He, he sits back and he just has a heyday with that. And uh, so I want us to look at something. I'm just going to give you several verses this morning and a platform. And then I want to give you uh, some ideas about this home where God dwells. Psalms 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord, unless God builds the home, then those that do labor in vain. Those that labor in vain who try to build it any other way. And we think about that, and, and you know, just looking at it in, in the New American sense, says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. And we can go on and talk about the city and the watchman and what all that means, but I, and I can tie that back into the family and show you some applications of that. But I want to go a little different direction. So let's pray this morning and see what God has for us. God, this morning, as we think about the home where God lives, God, as we think about that platform, as we think about society today and the tearing and the breaking down of homes, and God, where we need to go with that in relationships, and God, how we want to honor you, Lord, I pray this morning, Father, that you would help us to pull our lives together. God, that you would help us to pull our marriages together. God, that you would help us to, to really look, God, at what you desire for family. God, and not what the world says, not what we think, not what we feel. But God, what the biblical model says to us and how we ought to build a home, the foundational home, built upon the qualities of God. God, would you speak in our lives today, Holy Spirit, I pray. I ask you to do it in dramatic fashion this morning. Uh, for your glory, God, and your glory alone. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You know, when we think about it, a new study uh, comes out, and, and it really groups. Uh, I've told many people in my office that communication and uh, finances and sexual 
uh, things in life and marriage. That's the main causes of divorce and problems in marriage. Listen to what's going on. Some of the new ones, alcohol and drugs, number one. Finances and then sexual problems. And everything that you can begin to think about and just doing some reading and study, we can call it whatever. People will go into the divorce court and say, well, we're incompatible. And I told you, I made fun of that because we're all incompatible. And I told you even just the last week or so, talking about going to the restaurant, try it today. If you're married or you're a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, just say, hey, where do you want to go eat? Whatever you want to go do. Well, let's go to Burger King. No, I don't want Burger King. Well, let's go to McDonald's, you know. Let's get a hamburger. What do you want? I don't care. Whatever you want. Let's get chicken. No, I don't care. Well, what do you want? It doesn't matter to me. You know, you're not compatible. You're never going to be compatible. Understand that. I, I was talking to somebody yesterday. He said, you know, opposite, we've heard opposites attract, and that really does happen. Why? Because God in his supernatural ability really does that so that you and I can connect, so that we can balance one another out. And so, you know, when we call it, we may call it by all kinds of different names. When you break it down, uh, the, the categories stand out there when we talk about alcohol, when we talk about drugs or finances or whatever how it works out. It all comes in those headings. And we begin to dream up things on how to get out of there, uh, get out of marriage when we've got in, involved in it. So this morning, you know, when we think about who God wants the marriage to be, and we think about what the enemy does, listen, Satan knows. Satan's no dummy. Understand that this morning. Satan knows this morning when the home is disrupted. A major institution of God is damaged. He knows that lives are going to be hurt. When you look throughout the Word of God, our relationship in husband and wife is the same thing with God in church. He does that comparison. Marriage relationships and the church relationships. And we don't understand that. We miss that many times about uh, the church being, being the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. And how you and I ought to really work together. But I'm telling you, Satan knows that if he can tear the family apart, then he'll destroy a nation. He'll destroy the world, literally by tearing the family apart. You can go and look, and, and I, I won't take the time, I, I was going to take the time to do it this morning, but I won't. Go to, make a note and go to Titus chapter 2. Read those first few verses there, but you'll get down to chapter, uh, verse 5 of Titus chapter 2, and you'll find where it talks about the Word of God is dishonored, by the family who does not honor God with their life. Where, where Satan can get involved in the family, in the institution of the family, then you'll find that the word of God is literally, the word there is blasphemed, totally dishonored. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And, and, and you know, I've had people tell me, so I'm having a hard time praying. And, and many times the root cause is in their personal life, and a lot of times it's in their marriage life. And what the Word of God says, when you go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, He says, look, when there's a problem in the family, then your prayer life's going to be hindered. Not only are you going to take and hinder the Word of God or, or, or even dishonor the Word of God, but you're not even able to pray. And then if you go over to Ephesians chapter 6, and you look at those three verses, then you're going to find how that's passed from one generation to the next generation. And, and, and really the next generation is what's robbed or who is robbed from the life to which God wants us to have. It comes by teaching healthy families, healthy relationships. We were talking this morning in our Bible study class. We were thinking about words and we were talking about the fact someone in our class brought it up so they got a good friend that one of their family members could be in another room of their house and they'll just text to them and say dinner ready. Or they'll say this, this, this. But they don't even communicate. We've lost the act of communication. And we've lost it in our relationships. Boyfriend, girlfriends. Um, we've lost it in husband-wife relationships. We've lost it in parental relationships to our kids. We text and we don't have any personal involvement. So therefore, the family is suffering because of that. So what really happens? You ever heard the story, and it's a true story, but if you read it, about a home that really looked good on the outside. I mean, it looked great. And all of a sudden, in the next few days, they were there tearing it down, and this guy drives by. And he says, look, well, he goes up to the folks, he said, why? It's a nice animal home. He said, what is the deal? This is an ancient home. It's beautiful. Why are you tearing it down? And he took him on a journey, and he said, just come on inside. And when he went inside, once they broke it loose, the termites had eaten up from the inside. Now on the outside, it looked real good. It looked perfect. The sign was perfect. The, the trims were painted. All of that. It was great. But on the inside, it had literally been eaten up by the termites. And here's the thing. That's where many of our lives and our homes are today. We look good on the outside, 
We put on a picture, but on the inside, the termites are bearing away, and they're chewing away. And if we're not careful, it's going to crumble. It's going to crumble. And so we've got to do something about that. And so I want, I want to, this morning, to give you some realistic ideas about a home, about marriage, about what God said biblically marriage ought to be. Because I, I believe just in talking to couples, in talking to individuals, young people, uh, you know, when you're looking forward to marriage and what it ought to be. So biblical principles that actually fit for who we are and where we need to be. And, and then we have to decide what we're going to do with that. So we're talking this morning about a home where God dwells. Can I just tell you this morning, first and foremost, that God designed marriage to be celebrated, to be enjoyed, and to be fun. Believe it or not, listen, some marriages go through from the beginning, very shortly after the beginning, and they'll go to the end, and they're very miserable. But I'm telling you, that's not God's design. God intended for man and woman to come together, to have that home that would be celebrated, to be honored, to be, to be fun, to be exciting. God never said there was not going to be trouble, but he designed it for you and I to have fun and to celebrate. And I just want to ask you this morning, is your marriage relationship, is your dating relationship, the one you're in right now, is it fun? It is exciting. I tell our kids all the time, I say, you know, don't ever date somebody you wouldn't be willing to marry. And I, and I think when you look at that and you look at what God's Word says, God's Word teaches us that. And the thing is, God built a husband and wife to connect, but not only to connect, but to stay connected and to do whatever it takes to be connected. So, you know, when you think about it, God doesn't, achieve, uh, doesn't, God doesn't desire for us to live boring lives. The world out there says that you and I as Christians live bored and boring lives. That's not what God says. God says that it ought to be exciting. It ought to be full of energy. It ought to be full of life. No, don't settle for anything less. I'm telling you, we bought into this thing to where we settle in on a scale of 1 to 10. We'll settle in for the 3, 4, 5, and we think we're doing great. And God wants us to get up there at 7, 8, 9 and really be what he's caused us, uh, called us to be. And I'm telling you, it's fun for me when I sit down and talk to some of our seniors and I hear them talk about 50 years, I hear them talk about 60 years, I hear them talking about approaching 70 years of marriage. Or I hear somebody say, well, this is what my life was like and I miss my, my spouse. They've gone on to be with the Lord and it's been 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, but I'm telling you, I had a godly spouse. We had a godly marriage. God honored us. It blesses me to hear that. And I'm telling you, we need to hear more stories of that. And what I want you to understand this morning, don't miss. Don't miss what God has for you this morning. Enjoy one another. Spend time. Enjoy one another. So we've been married 34 years. And I'm telling you, we, 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 we learn to enjoy one another. We're still learning. And God does some great, great things and has done some great things in our life. But I take, it takes perseverance. These guys have been married 40, 50, 60 years. It takes perseverance to get there and to literally still have fun, to still love one another. Young people that are approaching marriage, Randy Living back there, God, God willing that we get married later on in, in December. But, you know, you guys, as you look at that, look at it with the perspective of what God wants. And look at it long term. What does God really want for your life? Begin to plan and begin to, to learn and say, God, I want to be that wife. I want to be that husband that I need to be. God, help me to love one another. Help me to learn to love deeply. Guys, husbands this morning, learn to, to love your wife because Christ loved the church. God, I never said it. God gave you your wife as a gift. We need to learn to cherish that gift and to deeply, deeply love her. Some of you this morning, if you're honest, you probably said, Pastor, just to be honest with you, I don't know how to love my wife. I've had people in my office that say, you know, we really didn't love each other when we got married. We got married for whatever reason. Now we're trying to get our lives right with God, so what do we do? And I told them. You get on your knees and you begin to beg God to teach you how to love like you want to love. God, help me to, to love like you really want me to love. God, I, I started this thing maybe in the wrong way, but, but God, I, I want to know how to love. And I want to tell you this morning, and I tell them, the model is found in God's Word. 
When, when you begin to look there, and if you go to Ephesians, and you look at Ephesians chapter 5, and you can look, and people that are really wanting to know about love, I, I take them to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and you know, when you, when you hear these words, and you begin to look, and, and it says love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love is not bragging, love is not boastful, love is not arrogant, uh, love is not uh, uh, act rudely, or love is not selfish. All of these kinds of things. And this is how we learn to love. See, we can all revert back to those key points of love. Where they were just surface. Where they were just there on the surface. And for whatever reason. And I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'll make, I'll make a statement this morning according to the Word of God. You can never know what love is until you understand God's love. Amen. I'm just telling you. You say, Pastor, I've had this, I've had that. Listen, I'm just telling you, until you get your life right with God, you'll never know what love is. That's right. Never know. you got a, you got a, a, a faith surface kind of love. But I'm telling you, when you learn to love Jesus, and you learn God's love, and you begin to be able to build that love into your marriage, and your relationship, man, I'm telling you, that's where God shows up, and God, God shows us how to love. God does some great things. But I'm telling you this morning, some of us need to learn to celebrate our marriage. We need to learn. Listen, some of us are sitting in this building this morning, and it's been one year, five years, ten years, fifteen years or longer, and we've never taken a, a date night or a trip by ourselves. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. Pastor, we can't afford it. Yeah, you can afford it. You afford it to do a lot of other things. Just simplify it. Simplify it. Go camping. Some of you go camping and you don't spend a lot of money. 15, 20 bucks a night. That's pretty cheap. You can do it. If you regard your relationship as important, you'll make it happen. You'll make it happen. Because here's the deal. We learned this in men's group the other night. Whatever we desire to do, we're going to make it happen. We're going to do what we want to do, regardless. And so if your relationship is important, you'll make it happen. And you'll spend some time together. You'll spend some time where you get, uh, where it's exciting and it's fulfilling and it's loving and all of that kind of stuff. It, it's what it is. Let me just take you on to the second thing this morning. We need to learn to really just honor God with our marriage, to have fun, to be exciting about our marriage. But I'm telling you, God not only designed marriage to be exciting and fun and rewarding and honoring and all that kind of stuff, but he designed it for love and affection. Here's a major area where the world has taken it and distorted it. The world on that first point has stolen our time. We get too busy. Listen, let me just back up for a minute. We get so busy with our kids that we forget about our relationship as husband and wife. We neglect that relationship, and then in just a short period of time, the alligators come hunting. And Satan comes because the door is open and we get bit. Now, we've done good things because we poured it all into our kids. But I'm telling you this morning, adults this morning, young people, write it down. One of these days you're going to be in a relationship. Some of you are sitting so close I can't even see between you already this morning. But here's the deal. You're going to wake up one day and you need to realize what's going on in your life. The way you are right now, all hooked up, you're going to be the same way you are 40 years down the road. That's the way it ought to be. It ought to be that kind of fun. It ought to be that kind of excitement. And don't let the world steal it away in the name of other things. Your kids are important. And you've got to spend time with them. But you better guard the time that God gives you. That's right. You better make the time happen. I don't care if it's in the evening when you put the kids to bed. I don't care if it's early in the morning. But listen to me. It's okay for you to schedule a date night and let somebody else take care of the kids and take them to football practice and take them to soccer practice. Because right. if you don't protect your marriage, you don't protect your relationship, your kids are going to get busted. Right. So we don't like to look at that. But your kids are going to get busted. And let me just tell you, it doesn't matter what age your kids are. They can be adult. And mom and dad split up, it still hurts. It still hurts. Now, love and affection. God designed marriage for love and affection. I'm convinced this morning that many men in this building and most ladies don't even understand what love and affection is. Some of us think we get in the bed together and we have sex. That's all it is about love and affection and so much more. 
It's a major part of it. And I'm telling you, I understand all of that. But when we talk about love and affection, it's a part of the fun, it's a part of the excitement, it's a part of the celebration. We need to know how to be affectionate. God, ladies, you need to tell guys how to be affectionate to you. Because we don't understand. We miss it. God didn't wire us like he wired you. We're not emotional individuals when it comes to that kind of thing. So you just need to either write it down, put it on big letters, put it on a billboard, whatever you got to do. Put our name on the billboard and say, Dave, this is what I need done. Put it out there. <laughs> put, it, put it on the screen. Whatever. Do whatever you got to do to cause your husband to know what affection is. Because I'm telling you, we just don't get it. And, and, and we know about the calls, we know about the texts, we know about the notes, we know about the words of affirmation, we know about doing things around the house. Listen, I guarantee you we've still got generations of people in here that think husbands ought to do this, wives ought to do that, and there's no crosswalk. I guarantee you we do. We live in a generation today that better understand that it takes both of us to make the whole work. Husbands ought to be in the flower bed, they ought to be in the yard, cleaning house, doing whatever it takes, and wives right there with them. I probably got guys in this building this morning that says, I'm not ever going to cook. I've got wives in here that says, I'm not going to ever cook. Listen, you better learn. You better learn how to feed that picture. Go ahead and be in before the thing that's in. The thing is, we better learn, guys. Listen, listen to me. If we don't stroke our mates, somebody else is. You understand that? And let me just tell you, just because you've been married 50 years don't make any difference. Just because you're 50 and above, that don't make any difference either. And you and I need to understand that. We need to be real about it. When we talk about a home where God dwells, I'm telling you, some of us need to get past this. And some of the worst things that we've got is what great-granddaddy, granddaddy, and daddy taught us. And we really need to learn what godly men, not what great-granddaddy, granddaddy, and daddy taught us, but what really what God says, the ultimate daddy. Right. We need to learn how to really be a man. And we need to learn really how to love our wife. And some of you wives need to understand what the Word of God says and how to humble yourself before God and before your husband and really be the woman that God has called you to be. When you look at what God has done, God created and He gave to the man and woman that exciting and fulfilling God lies of marriage. And I'm telling you, when you talk about affection, when you talk about uh, the sexual act, when you talk about all that, sex is defined for the marriage inside the boundaries. I want to take you, just go with me over to Proverbs. I want to show you something. Now, I'm talking to you straight from the Word of God this morning. But I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Turn over there and look at something. I want you to mark it. I want you to take a long look at this. So I just need to look at it. I think I gave, I don't know if I gave it to you, Crystal, or notes, but it's Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. I want you to look what it says. The writer, Solomon, now, there's a new movie out too that's called The Song, and I think it's playing in Mobile. You go see it. It's written off the Song of Solomon. Probably every couple ought to go see it. Here's what he said. Now look what he says here. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Now, somebody's reading that and you're saying, well, wow, he's talking about a well of water and all this. I ain't what he's talking about. What he's talking about there is that you and I, as married folks, are to have sex with your own wife. You don't go looking for somebody else. Drink fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed? Look what he said. Be dispersed to rob streams of water and streams. Let them be yours alone and not strangers. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. And a loving uh, deer, a graceful dove, let her breath satisfy you at all times. Look what he says. Now, I want you to mark this word in verse 19. Uh, New American Standard says, be exhilarated. But when you look at this word, you know what it means? Be intoxicated. Be intoxicated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be intoxicated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of another man's wife, another foreigner? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all of his past. I'm telling you, every one of us need to mark that down. I mean, you guys say it, amen. So maybe you're uncomfortable as a bug on a hand bed. But I'm telling you this morning, it's true in the Word of God. And here, here's the deal. Listen. 
We've got 12, 13, and 14-year-olds that are actually sexually active. And then too many days ago, I was talking to uh, this guy. We were talking about the fact of being sexually active. And, and, and even in, I, I've heard of our counselors, our, our secular counselors, telling our young people it's okay to, to do drugs and okay to do sex and okay to do alcohol and all this kind of stuff. Listen, guys, we need to wake up and be careful what the world is telling us because that's why we got babies raised with babies. And we got 12, 13, and 14 year olds that are sexually active. And you and I need to listen up and listen to our young boys and listen to our girls and our young men and our young ladies. And I'm telling you, we need to listen. We need to teach them how to find their identity in Christ. Not some guy out there that's wanting to get in bed with them. That's right. Find their identity in Christ. And I'm telling you, adults, we need to teach them what that means about their identity in Christ. Take them to the Word of God. Show them what it means. Listen, girls, when you give yourself away, that can never be reclaimed. It's done. It can never, ever, ever in any way be reclaimed. You guys need to understand that. In that moment when you give yourself away, it can never be redeemed. Never, ever again in the same way we've ever been the same. Let me just say this to you. I have one of our deacons break down. Our deacon make this tear flow. But here's this real simple thing. All you guys and young girls, when they get to be about 12 or 13, every one of you ought to take them out of the day. And you ought to take a little ring, something that you bought, special to you. Mine had, that I bought for Casey had two parts. You take them on a date, and you give them what we term, Johnny and I talked this a long time ago to us, you give them what we term as a promise ring. And that's what you're doing with that girl is, she's promising your part, her part, to your part, to the day she gets married. And you see, when Jim and Casey walked on this platform some time ago, I took that promise ring off her hand. She's not here this morning. She's in Brookhaven, one of her friends. But I took that ring off her hand, and I took a chain, and I put that ring on a chain, and I put it around her neck. And then in that service, I took Jim's ring that he had got to her, and I slipped that ring. I slipped that ring on her head with all her finger. And at that moment, I took her ring and I put it on Tim's finger and I brought them together. And at that moment, I, as dad, gave her away to him. And I took that chain and I put that around and I said, baby, you swap. Jim now is your husband. He's your leader. And I'm not your leader anymore. But I want you to put that ring on that chain and put it around you and you hold me close to you. Here's the deal, guys. We need to be serious about that. And we need to take our girls out, and we need to explain to them, not just the birds and the bees, but we need to explain to them about what it means when we put that ring on that finger. And I'm telling you, statistics tell us true love weight. Robert probably knows the statistics. But just doing the, the rings and the promise rings and the purity rings, whatever you want to call it, has protected a man and girl from crossing the line. I want to tell you something, guys, listen to me. Take your young men out, your sons. And you take them, you don't have to give them a ring, but you take them and you help them in that wider passage. From where they are, listen, they're going through adolescence, their bodies are changing, they're warped and they're thinking, they think they know more than you. But you sit down and you tell them how much you love, what God's done in your life, and how to go in the wider passage in the manhood. Watch what it does to that. You watch what it does. I mean, we're talking about affection. We're talking about love. But I'm telling you right now, guys, I'm telling you what God desires for us to be, that we stay pure in marriage, that we realize that there's somebody greater than us. I just read to you a moment ago about the eyes of God. So we try to do all this stuff under hidden circumstances. But the eyes of God, the Creator, is shining down upon us. And He knows every move. That's me. So I'm word and I'm crossing over to the third. Pastor, my parents don't know it, nobody else knows it. Maybe somebody in our spouse this morning. I've already crossed the line, Pastor. I need some help. What can happen in my life? Girls will never get your virginity back. Guys will never get back what you did when you crossed the line. But I'm telling you, God 
will forgive you. Yeah. And God will restore you. And I just want to tell you guys that are in relationships where your husband, wife, boyfriends, and girlfriends, and you cross those lines, God will forgive you. It's a process as far as working through it. God forgive you instantaneously. Removes the sins far as east from the west. But it's a process for you and I. Our feeble minds. And, and, and we're not God. But the fact is God loves us more than we love ourselves. And I'm telling you, when we talk about love and affection, we, I'm telling you, we need to talk in our homes about it. God wants us to be excited, to honor Him. He wants our marriage to be fun. He wants it to be celebrated. And I challenge you to celebrate together. The third thing, celebrating, honoring, having fun. Marriage should be loved and affectionate. Here's where some of us kind of get off track. God designed marriage for authority. God designed marriage for authority. And when we look at that this morning, the ultimate authority is God. Listen, folks, he is the one who built marriage. He's the one who created sex. That's why he wanted to decide marriage. He wanted it to be fun. He wanted to be excited. And that's why he created affection. That's why he gave us direction. He ought to be authority. And listen now, when we get God off the authority in our lives, even as a young man or a young lady or one of these adults in here, myself included, when we take God off the authority, we got a mess. You understand that? There's another term I probably need to use for that. I, I don't want to get anybody's but the fact is, we, we've got a mess. And, and our ultimate authority is God. And I'm telling you, God ordains the marriage union. Therefore, God has to be authoritative in that. Listen, he's, he's designed it with him. The husband is the leader. And the wife, the wife and husband are, are equal on many aspects. But there comes a time when the husband has to be the head of the house. And what do we find? Anything with two heads is what? A monster. Two-headed monster. And anything with two heads is nothing but monsters. So I'm telling you, when we think about who we are this morning, let me just say to you, husbands and wives are to deal with their children in equal matter. We're equal when we talk about marriage. Husbands not above. Matter of fact, when I do a marriage ceremony, I said, look, you're standing side by side this afternoon or tonight. You're not on one another's feet. Nowhere in God's word does it give the right to dominate. You women understand. It doesn't give you a right to dominate your husband. Down him. Tell him how bad he is. Tell him how sorry he is. You ought to be building him up if you're a child of God. You ought to be telling him, find one little good thing about your husband and beat it like a dead horse if you have to. But find something good. One of our problems is we got women that beat us down as men and beat us down. We can never do anything right. That's not the biblical model. At the same time, men ought to be those men who love their wives like Christ loved the church. To really step out and be the leader. We got men all over this building this morning. I guarantee you, that's never praying for your wife. That's an audacity in the face of God. We got men that's never prayed on their family. It's an audacity in the face of God. We need to be praying, guys. You may go home today and say, I don't even know what to say. Well, sit down and say the blessing. I don't care. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. If you can't say nothing else, but God, thank you. That's it. And then let God do something else. God will take you, and God will do more for you than you ever understood. Listen, husband, you and I need to be the head of the household. That doesn't mean you abuse your power. I've had guys in the office that said, this is the way it's going to be because this is what I want. I tell you, you're in a mess of carpet. That's, right. That's never what God said. Never. God doesn't say that you and I rule with the iron thumb. That goes back to granddaddy, great granddaddy, and daddy's theology many times. That's right. Just like he said that you ought to never cry because it makes you look like a weeping. Tell him to read the word of God. Yes. Find what Jesus done. I'm telling you, husbands and wives need to cry together. Yes. And I'm telling you, we got some women this morning, just as we got some men. You may not even deserve to be married, but you are, and you need to learn how to be godly men and godly women. I'm telling you, as we look at this according to the Word of God, guys, you need to learn to, to lead your family, to really give all. You need to set the example. Being the protector, being the admonisher. The, the word admonish, we don't usually use that in a male term, but listen to that. And as, a, as a man, you and I are to admonish the family. You know what the word admonish, when you go look at it, the Greek is? How many of you have ever seen old Ken taking this cover up for A's and cover up for B's? That's what it means to admonish. And that's what the man ought to do for the family. 
admonish. Cover the family in a holy manner under God. And I'm telling you wives, once you've got a godly man and you're working on it together, learn to respect your husband. Learn to build him up. It's not your place to tear him down. It's not your place to tear each other down. The world does a good job at it. Both of you guys, parents, you ought to have equal authority over your children. Now here's where we get in mixed authority, but I'm going to tell you this. We'll go ahead and make a statement. We've got a lot of families that come together and and, and been separations, divorces, and God gave you another mate, and you're blessing, and you got children. You both have to have authority over your children. God is the authority, man and woman, and let me just say this to you, man and woman, your relationship has to come before your children and you. Has to. Because what's going to happen, if you don't lose it in the midst of your children, when your children graduate and head off to college, you're not going to know each other, guess what's going to happen? You're going to split your why you gotta be in mind. And so that's why we do it God's way. And so, you know, when you, husbands, you, you learn to love your wife and your family like God really wants you to. And when you do that, you nourish them, you admonish them, you'll provide for them. That, that word cherish literally means to, to just spread your wings and admonish, like I was talking about, spread your wings over. You'll know how to love your wife. Why? You, listen, you can read all the books you want to, but go and see what God says. Just ask God, how do I love my wife? How do I love my husband? What do I need to do to be a godly husband? What do I need to do to be a godly wife? And open yourself up. You heard me say it, and I'll say it again. We know this national statistics are about 50% of marriages actually as close to 60 now end in divorce. Why don't you listen to this fact, guys? Listen, ladies. When a couple is actively involved in church and Bible study, it's less than 5%. That's It's a pretty good statistic. And so, ladies, just be what God wants you to be. Let, let God's love just abound and be the best you can be. Listen, guys, listen, your wife's not a slave. For some of you ladies that had bad relationships and abusive relationships and, and you were slaves and all that, God never intended that to be that way. Amen. That's not the model that God put. You're not a slave. You're a gift that's been given. And, and you need to be honored. And you need to be cherished. We learn to do that as we honor ourselves before God. Let me just say this to you, ladies, and we'll wrap it up. Ladies, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself for your husband. Look the very best you can for your husband. Not for anybody else. You don't need to be drawing attention to yourself for anybody else. You need to be drawing your husband's attention. And I'm telling you, don't let yourself go. Guys, do the same thing. But do the best you can to be attracted to, to, your, to your wife. Listen, we get older. <laughs> Dale Odom, a pastor friend at Topeka, put a post on Facebook this week, and he said, man, God, help me. He's probably, Dale's probably about four years old than we are. He said, man, I know about the hair growing out the ears and the hair about the nose and growing for places I've never grown before, but what about the top of my nose? <laughs> he said, man, I had to pluck that thing out. And uh, so he does everything. Listen, we drop where we never dropped before. We droop, whatever you want to call it. We don't look the same. <laughs> Something just happens over time, all right? But it does not keep us from taking care of ourselves. It does not care, keep us from looking good, being God. I told you, I got a hot wife. I don't blame you. I don't hang around the bush. I just tell you. Just with you. 51 years old. Listen, I was up. I saw Al Hawkins in, in Walmart. Saturday, and I was talking to him. He said, man, I saw Selena a few weeks, about a few days ago, when they were leaving. He said, she still looks good. I said, yeah, buddy, she's good. Foam in the mouth. You know? <laughs> I'm glad I got a wife that takes care of herself. And she's her. What you see on Sunday is what you'll see on Monday through Saturday. Amen. That's just the way it is. And I love her, and she knows that. And uh, so, you know, the thing is, be God. You nor your husband, ladies, will ever be complete until you know how to bow to Jesus. You want to know how to, and they've never been perfect, but you pick somebody out. Don and Bernice through it. I love these guys. They've been exercised. Maybe Miss Bernice has helped, but not allowed to do that. They've been swimming through all that embarrassment, brother. I didn't ask for permission. But, I mean, just it blesses me if you see if you can hang around them. And Doc and James and some of those folks look like that. It blesses me. Go sit down and talk to them. See how they made it. They've been there. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go 
Don't do what they do. Listen to them. Sit at the feet of Jesus. <coughs> Walter and Kathy, and they struggle. You get up to them. It ain't been easy. Ladies, go to Proverbs 31. We're not going to do it this morning. But you go to Proverbs chapter 31, and the secret of your wife, uh, of your life, is fear and reverence of the Lord. Look at it yourself in Proverbs. The, the secret of your life is a Proverbs 31 is your fear and reverence for the Lord. Verse 30. We've been talking about a home where God dwells this morning, where, where we'll really honor God at all costs. Fruit producing. See it in our kids. Pastor, we, we, we've done a good job and our kids are straight. Listen, the Word of God says we're not going to have, we're, we're not going to raise kids and, and all of them will be perfect. You don't find that in the Word of God? Prodigal son say, I don't wait there, just look at them. I don't understand. We don't have the answers why we have one child this way, one child that way, two children this way, three this way. We don't understand all of that. But I'm telling you as parents, you and I are called to honor God. To be what God wants us to be. To literally have fun. I dare say there's parents in here where you never let your kids see the affection, the hugging, the kissing, the relationship. How are they going to learn? If you don't teach them and they don't see it, they're going to learn it on the internet. Used to be in a magazine or somewhere, but they're going to see it on the internet today. Wake up! Same thing with grandkids. You better show them because they're going to find somewhere else to go. We want to raise our children. If we want to have a home where God dwells, then you and I have got to set the example. How do you get there? Pastor, I, 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 I've got all this stuff down. I, I, I want to celebrate my marriage. I want to have love and affection. I, I understand this is a dark thing. How do we get there? And we're done. Truly done. First of all, you've got to surrender. You've got to surrender yourself. Some of you know that as hard as you've tried, you've tried to honor God, you're out of line when it comes to the biblical guidelines of marriage. We either got wives trying to dominate husbands or husbands dominating wives. We got folks that are split doing their own thing. All of that kind of stuff. Listen, the Bible says we ought to be one. Your bank accounts ought to be one. Your phones ought to be one. Your email accounts ought to be one. Now, I understand you may have separate email accounts, but you ought to have your phones open. There ought to be no passwords that are hidden from your spouses. You ought to be one. Surrender yourself. The phone ought to be in the open with some sanitation She's sitting right here. My phone is right out there. She can look at it. She can go to my email account. She can go to my Facebook. Listen, any one of you, outside of the stuff that we have to talk about, if I'm talking to somebody that's in confidentiality, you're welcome to it. I don't have anything to hide. I told you that. I told you that checkbook. You can ask my son's checkbook anytime you want. You can get it. I don't care. I don't have anything to hide. And the thing is, you and I have got to learn to surrender ourselves. And listen, if we're in conflict, why are we in conflict? Because one or the other is trying to win. It ain't about winning. That ain't good English, but it works. It ain't about winning. You need to surrender yourself. That's the problem when we get into arguments. Somebody wants to win. And we're going to beat the heck out of the other one until we do win. And the other was just steady withdrawing. We're steady beating. They're steady withdrawing. We're steady beating. And they're down as low as they can go in your still hand. It's not about winning, guys. It's very, ladies, it's not about winning or losing. It's about being godly. And I'm telling you, some of us this morning need to get right with God. We, we have been an antagonistic, and you finish the line, to our husband or to our wife. And we need to get right with God. We need to apologize to God. We need to ask God for forgiveness the way we treated our wife, how we treated our husband. And we need to get right with God. We need to surrender. The second thing we need to do this morning is we need to forgive. We need to forgive. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I've been a but. Can I say that? I just did. <laughs> I, I, I've been that, and I really want you to forgive me. I, I, I want you to forgive me. I want to put the past in the past, and I want us to leave it there. Will you, will you please forgive me? And, and I know it's not going to be easy, but, but I want us to come together. I really want us for the first time in our life to honor God. We need to learn to forgive. We need to learn to surrender. And then the last thing is we need to have oneness. Oneness in the Spirit. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Spirit of God.
That's what needs to happen. Everything else doesn't matter if we'll bring it to the table and surrender to self. If we'll plead forgiveness and we'll search oneness with the Spirit. I'm telling you, listen, if we'll do those three things, intimacy is going to happen. It's going to be greater than you ever expected. There's going to be direction. There's going to be greater affection. And you may even get to the point where you say, look, I don't need it anymore. Just, just take it. It's all going to come. And here's the most important thing. When we think about that forgiveness and surrender and all that, we put it under the blood of Christ. They know what the song for a moment yet. But we put it on the blood of Christ. And I'm going to tell you, folks, and we're about to go to invitation. If you'll do what I've asked you to do as a pastor. Here, here, here's the thing. Have so many people come to I don't want to tell me what to do. See, that's a lie from Satan's thing. Because if we're in trouble, we need somebody to tell us what to do. Right? We need somebody to tell us what to do. I bring drug addicts in, I bring alcoholics, I bring married folks in. They look, I'm here, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. They just work on their merry way. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to make it. you got to learn to listen to those who love you. Because they're looking out for you. So, if we'll do those things, God will honor the family. I want to tell you, God honor your relationships. Pastor, I cross the line. Cry for forgiveness. So let God forgive you. Set your eyes on purity and be what God wants you to do. Man or boys, women, girls, it doesn't matter. Godly home, reflection of salvation. I put it as straightforward as I could at this point. Psalms 127 1. Unless God builds the house, they labor in vain. Before the praise team comes this morning, I just want you to bow your head for a moment. I want a moment of examination on all of our hearts this morning. If you're married this morning, you take your spouse by the hand. If you're not, if you're in a boyfriend girlfriend relationship, same thing. Normally, we don't let girls and guys touch each other. But I'll let you hold them by the hand this morning. If your spouse is not here for whatever reason, I want you to just begin to pray for them. Maybe you had a spouse and, and they've gone on to be with the Lord. Would you thank God for them? Would you just reach out and touch God this morning? Right now, it's an invitation time. I probably had one of the greatest burdens on my life as a pastor that I've ever had in all my ministry, even through the difficult times of ministry. But in these last, probably a year and a half, <coughs> you know, the last six months, the greatest burden on my life is families. Kids, moms, dads, husbands, wives. I want you this morning let me just start with our young people when I stand before you. I don't want you to look up. First of all, if you've never crossed the line, young men and young ladies, I want you to say, God, from this day forward, I want to be as pure as pure can be. God, I want you to help me to protect myself from ever crossing the line. Daddies, mamas, if you've got a kid in this bunch this morning and you've never given them a promise ring, I want you to do that. I'm asking you as your pastor. I can't make it. I'm asking you got a son in this bunch, I want you to take them out and talk to them about the rite of passage. If they're 12 or 13 years old, you need to talk to them. Now, y'all people, if you're one of those that have crossed the line, Pastor, I, I have. That's between you and God and whoever else knows. I want you to just say, God, this moment, I want you to forgive me. And God, I'm sorry that I crossed the line. Emotions, whatever, doesn't mind at that point. God, forgive me. Maybe you've asked God to forgive you in the past. Fine, he's done it. But I want you to ask him this morning, God, keep me pure until I'm married. For our single adults this morning, something similar to that. For our married folks this morning, again, if your spouse is sitting here, I want you to thank God for them. I want you to pray over them. If your spouse is at a distance somewhere this morning, would you pray for them? I want you to take our time right now to pray for your kids or your grandkids or both. God, I want to be that parent. God, help me to be a godly man and a godly woman. Help us to be godly parents, to teach them how to love in a healthy environment. Help us with our grandkids, God. So our single folks, as you're praying for God's made in life, I'm asking you just to intervene and ask God right now to give you direction. 
Maybe God settled with you to stay single for the rest of your life. I don't know. Between him and, and you at that point. Maybe you can say, Pastor, you know, I'm an adult and I've crossed the lines, but I want to do things right. Under God's leadership, I want to do things right. Would you cry out to him this morning? Other folks this morning, maybe say, Pastor, I've never been saved this morning. I don't know what it means to be saved. I don't even know what you're talking about. I, this Jesus guy, he may be, he, I understand he's the son of God. And he went to the cross. He did. He died for your sin. He shed his blood so you might have forgiveness of sin. And if the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you this morning, I'm asking you to respond to him. You may not understand, but if you'll just say, Lord, I want to surrender my life. I want forgiveness of sin. I ask you to come into my life and change me. You'll do that this morning. Some of us this morning need to seek the forgiveness of God. Seek the forgiveness of our spouses, of our children, maybe even somebody else. But we need to lay our life on the line. Jim, pray, Steve, will ask you very quietly, very softly, to make your way to the back. I want you guys to be ready to go with the invitation. Some of you guys may need to be on the altar. That's okay. We'll make do. You need to be on the altar. You go to the platform. If you're on the platform, you need to come down and kneel when you do so. You have freedom this morning. Congregation, I want to pray. And after I pray, I want you just to be open. These altars are open. You can move to the altars now. I want men and women, grandparents, you, if you really, really want to be sincere and have a home where God dwells. Young people, if you really want to be pure, if you really want to stay pure to marriage, I ask you to go to the altar this morning. I ask you to even just fall on your face before God. Go ahead, Patty, if you'll give play. I'm asking you this morning, husbands, wives, men, women, young people, single, married, whatever the case may be, I'm just asking you to be open to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, home where God really dwells. God, awesome testimonies of what you've done in some homes and lives. But God, you want to do so much more. So God, I pray, as best I know how, God, I want you to relieve me of that burden. God, I want you to, I preach your word as best I know how. I'm laying these people before you today, God. And I ask you to move as you would, God. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Lead us where we need to go. But God, most of all, make our homes a home where God dwells. In his name I pray. Amen. Stand with us. Be all the prayer.